Secretary of Economy, 60% of the income of Boeing, General Dynamics, and Raytheon came from the military. Federal money paid for 90% of the cost of research on aviation and space. The defense buildup did create jobs. So there is that. There is a huge inflow of money, injection, injection of money into the economy through defense spending. Uh, the cost of one Huey helicopter could have built 66 units of low-income housing. That's something to think about. One helicopter could provide 66 families with low-income housing. Okay, this is an interesting slide. Uh, this is the r rise and fall of income inequality. I, this is kind of important, I think. So what you see here, in 1920s, the roaring 20s, income inequality was really high. That means, let's say, uh, let's say Walmart. I'm I'm not mad at Walmart. I'm not picking on them. I'm just they're an easy example to think of. If you just get hired, if I went over there after I'm done with my illustrious career of teaching and apply for a job waving and smiling at people as they come in the door, you know, sweet old man, uh, they'll pay me probably a minimum wage, at least to start out, right? So whatever that is, I, I'm not sure what it is now. It might be $15 an hour. Uh, this income inequality ratio is the ratio between an average worker in the company versus the top CEO. So if the CEO is getting half a million a year, and I'm getting $15 an hour. That's the income inequality. I might be oversimplifying, but that's the basic idea. So what is the ratio of the top CEO to the average worker in the company? And so you see the roaring 20s, it was almost out of control. And then suddenly what happens here? Actually, the Great Depression was right here. So you see a little drop off there in the Great Depression, but it pretty much continued during the Great Compre Depression. Uh, that means that there's a bunch of people unemployed, a bunch of people going hungry, but in income inequality was still very high. What happened in 1937, that was the set start of the second term of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's second term in office. He passed a number of measures, so, so social income security, income social security, a number of other measures. Uh, they increased the, the base tax rate, so the wealthy had to pay more taxes. And these measures ended up reducing this income inequality. Plus, along comes 1941 and World War I. And so you have a very different situation right here in the middle of World War II. I said World War I. I meant World War II. So you have uh, World War II, income inequality falls off. And the top executives are making more than their employees, but not extremely more. And then that goes along in the 1950s. Do you know that, I don't have the exact math number, but in the 1950s, uh, the top wealthiest people paid about 80% of their income in taxes. That's a lot of, that's a lot of your income. That was during Eisenhower's period, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy. In fact, when Kennedy comes into the office, he actually, as a Democrat, a liberal Democrat, he was the first one to propose reducing taxes on the wealthy with the idea that they would create more job, more businesses and more jobs and it would trickle down into the economy. Later, that phrase trickle down economics was made famous by by who? We haven't got there yet, but we're on our way there. Ronald Reagan. Thank you, Samuel. So that Ronald Reagan is elected around 1981, 1980. So Ronald Reagan comes along. His uh, vice president running mate, who was running against him initially, H.W., George H.W. Bush, called it voodoo economics. And, uh, Reagan said, we need to cut taxes on the wealthy because they're the most productive. They're going to go out. If they, if you cut their taxes, they'll go out and create new businesses. They'll create new jobs, and that will benefit everyone. It sounds good in theory, but notice 
it starts going up, the income inequality. And now you're into the 1990s and Bill Clinton's era, and it keeps going up and up and up, and here we are now. Well, actually, not now. We're probably worse now. We're probably up here. So that's the 20th century in income inequality. It's something to think about, okay? Any comments? You all good with that? Maybe you could work hard, study hard, become a CEO. My friend, uh, no, I'm not going to tell that story. Uh, another day, I'll tell it some other day. Okay. What? Yeah, I have a friend who complained for years that he wasn't making enough money. And then he finally got a job and he's been promoted rapidly. And now he's making pretty good money and he's working his ass off. And he's complaining and he's tired all the time. And I said, I don't want to hear it. So uh, Anheuser-Busch was Bud, the king of beers, back in the 1950s. Uh, so this goes into the issue of advertising and, you know, it's cute sayings. There were a lot of mergers. A lot of smaller companies were merging into bigger companies, which can be a, become a problem if the, it tends to... Uh, domination of the economic market. Um, executive leadership was prized. It, it became more and more specialized to be able to get the training and the development to be able to manage a multinational enterprise. It requires a more specialized and dynamic form of executive leadership. So top managers uh, started going to business school Education became more important, especially business education. Skills in corporate planning, marketing, and investment were needed. Uh, there was a massive growth of white-collar workers, which is uh, also the roads of the middle class. This book, the, uh, the Lonely Crowd by sociologist David Reisman, was a big hit in 1950. And it's basically talking about the emerging middle class, the white middle class of the 1950s. United States. I have not read it, but I did note it down today to look into it. I always am trying to read stuff to better equip me to come and talk to you guys. So I'll be teaching this class again in the fall, and I, I'm probably going to read a book over the summer about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. That'll help give me more knowledge of the 1950s and 60s. So the power balance shifted during the Great Depression and after World War II to labor. Um, if I get, went back here to this, this one, when you're at this point, you can kind of guess if CEOs are making 10, 15, 20, 100 times more than their workers, the power balance is probably leaning towards the executives, the management. However, in this period, when you have less inequality and CEOs are making not making that much more than their workers, they're making more, of course, but not ex ridiculously more, the power balance started shifting down to the workers and to labor unions and collective management. And uh, so this is when uh, the United Auto Workers arose to challenge General Motors. By the way, last year, they, the United Auto Workers also went on strike. I don't know if any of you followed that. Sean Fain, I think, is the name of the head of the current head of the United Auto Workers, and he came up with a real smart strategy that uh, it would shut, had rolling shutdowns of plants, and but the automakers could have no, didn't have any idea which plants were going to be shut down when. And that threw them off balance and, and it allowed the workers to make some progress with their demands. And they got a pretty good pay hike last year. Uh, they deserved one because the automakers are making huge windfall prof profits, but they didn't want to give, they didn't want to increase their workers' pay. What do you think? If uh, a company is making huge profits, should the workers cut of those profits? Yeah, it seems like a no brainer, doesn't it? But sometimes that's not uh, how people think. They want to instead uh, create higher executive salaries or invest it in buybacks of their stock or help 
greater dividends to the stockholders, but the workers are end up holding the short end of the stick. Therefore, collective bargaining can be necessary. Anybody ever worked at Starbucks here? No? Uh, I worked at Burger King when I was young. got fired but I quit first uh, and understand that uh, Starbucks is in the process of forming unions not maybe not all at once but certain Starbucks have been union, union unionizing which I think is a good thing so in post-war Europe the Allies were constructing welfare states this was a little different than the United States and welfare state you have more safety net programs from the from the government things like child care and education uh, certain parts of europe you don't need to pay to go to college if, if, if you're a citizen of that country you can go to college for free uh, we don't have that in the united states so collective bargaining kind of took its place if you were part of a union you were protected and your union would go to bat for you and they would bargain on your behalf for uh, better salaries, better working conditions, a good pension, etc. So the fact that in recent years, since the Reagan revolution, uh, basically unions have been on the defensive and have been receding uh, means less bargaining power and less security for workers. Partly, That's partly because of the offshoring moving things to China, moving companies out to Mexico, and less good-paying jobs here in the United States. Am I losing you all? You hanging with me? <coughs> Bring it on. Is that what you said? Bring it on. Okay, the Affluent Society. Um, in the 1950s, the American good life emerged with exceptional distinctiveness, <coughs> preference for suburban living, High value on consumption, devotion to family, and domesticity. So, suburbs are what? Do we have suburbs in Miami? I'm not sure we do. Maybe in the Redlands. You know what a suburb is? It's outside the urban area. Usually, houses with a half an acre or an acre. Uh, Quiet streets, nice schools. It's not urban. Uh, so, what would be an urban part of Miami? I suppose Little Havana is kind of urban. Uh, Westchester might be in between urban and suburban. So, I don't know if we actually do have su classic suburbs in Miami. I grew up around Columbus, Ohio, and we definitely had suburbs and in urban centers. So that means the the affluent people who could afford it would move out from the city center to the the outer edges of the city and buy a house with an acre, a house with five acres, you know, buy a riding mower and have your little plot of heaven in the suburban area. And so this was a tendency that began in the nineteen fifties among the 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 middle class, pr predominantly the white middle class. So uh, migration to the suburbs have been going on for a century, but never before on this scale. So in a decade or two, the farmland on the outskirts of the city would be filled up with tract housing and shopping malls. Entire counties that had once been rural were suburban by 1960. You can see this in Atlanta. You know, there's an, the land just keeps growing out. Uh, and Miami is kind of odd because we have the Everglades on one side and we have the uh, Biscayne Bay on the other. So you really can't grow out. You can only grow up, I guess, or get more crowded. Levitt towns were built by William J. Levitt. They used mass production techniques. So here's where it gets, where it gets a little crazy. So these, these are like quick prefab houses that you, you just you kind of came and you just put one wall up and then another one. And pretty soon you had a ready-made house uh, built kind of like on a mass produce productions uh, scheme. A four-room house with appliances cost $7,990. Uh, 
Now let's all have a moment of silence. <laughs> to feel the pain. In 1947, 7,890. Now, back here a little ways, we saw that, oh, I need that. Okay, we see right here that after this, uh, these collective bargaining things, the industrial workers were able to raise their real income from $54 a week to $71 a week. That was a huge victory. So don't feel too bad about the housing costs because, I mean, you know, that's a lot more than you'd make at Starbucks. A lot less, I'm sorry, a lot less than you'd make at Starbucks. You'd make that in a day, right? So they're making like $75 a week and then paying $8,000 for a house. It's still pretty doable if you have good credit and low interest. So even at 8,000, many young families couldn't afford it. So the FHA, have you ever heard of the FHA? The Federal Housing Administration was created. And the Veterans Administration both developed programs to provide loans for young couples or veterans at low mortgage rates. Or you could pay 5% down on an $8,000 house and pay 2 or 3% interest. Veterans paid 1%. So this, of course, home ownership jumped. I'm trying to think of a good question. Just say, I don't want to make you feel bad. Uh, talking about housing situations, what? I mean, it's it's life, right? It's just, it's our society that makes you feel bad. And uh, think when, at at this point in time, when you think about trying to ever own a house, it must be a bit overwhelming uh, because housing. You know, I, I, yeah, I'm not going to say that, but housing price in Miami, just for an average <laughs> three bedroom house, not far from the FIU campus, is going to be six to seven hundred thousand. Get a pool. Anyway, uh, that's depressing enough. Let's move on. There was also suburban racism. So uh, a lot of these programs were benefiting white, young white couples. But uh, these these Levittville uh, neighborhoods or houses came with restrictive covenants prohibiting occupancy by members other than the Caucasian race, which would include blacks, Jews, and Catholics. So this is where some people uh, make the, an effective argument that structural racism is built into the economic system of the society, even apart from individual attitudes, that when you have 70, 80 years of uh, preferential treatment to one particular part of the society and other, other parts of society can't buy houses and can't build wealth, that's an argument in favor of structural racism. Here's shifting population patterns. I suppose this is no surprise. Uh, people were moving south down to here and moving west. So these 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 states, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada were all growing. Florida was growing. Al uh, Georgia was growing. Even Virginia was growing somewhat. And then some of these other uh, states were declining, especially some of these urban centers like Detroit, Chicago, etc. This is a change in our society. The South and West begin to boom. Florida added 3.5 million people from 1940 to 1970. That was before the Mariel boat lift. Got another 200,000 people in just a few weeks. And there's been waves of like that in Florida, both coming from the south to escape persecution or poverty and coming from the north to escape what? Snow? Snow, mostly. By 1970, California contained one-tenth of the population of the entire country. And then the automobile became mass-produced and it got cheaper and Soon it was possible for even young adults to own automobiles, and that in turn created the baby boom. 
That's supposed to be a joke, but none of you got it. If you did, you you were impressed. Uh, gasoline. Here, here's some more pain. I'm so sorry. Gasoline costs fifteen cents a gallon. Yeah, I feel your pain. I drive by every day, and I've been looking at it. It just seems like it keeps ticking up. We're up to like three sixty now. Uh, in 1945, Americans owned 25 million cars. By 1965, Americans owned 75 million. That's a big jump in 20 years. Wait till you see the TVs. The uh, interstate highway system, this is in uh, 1930 and this is in 1970. Most of these were started in 1956 under the Eisenhower administration. They built things like I-95, I-70, I-10. These interstates were built during that period of time, the 1950s. Uh, why did they build them? Any ideas of the rationale? Yes, it's, it's one of the good results of the Cold War, maybe, because if you are under the threat of nuclear attack, you want to be able to move populations quickly. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure what good it would do. Where are you going to go? But that was the thinking. Also, the thinking being able to uh, have rapid troop movements. So the idea was a military idea to build all these uh, interlocking interstate highways to be able to facilitate in the case of war or a nuclear war. Uh, in any case, we got I-95. And... Uh, that was under Eisenhower. Here, I didn't actually experience this. This is the uh, duck and cover. You see a bunch of kids ducked down and covering their heads in case of a nuclear attack. What are you thinking, Danica? You're laughing. Yes, it's kind of pointless. Makes you maybe feel better until you think about it. Like, what good is it going to be to cover my head in a nuclear attack? But this is what they did. Uh, I didn't really, I wasn't in, born until 1951, so I don't know that this is as common in the 60s. I think after the Cuban Missile Crisis, we kind of realized it was kind of pointless. This also led to a massive growth in churches. Church membership jumped from 49% to, in 1940, to 70% in 1960. This is in the context of the Cold War, people looking for security, for comfort. Uh, Billy Graham was uh, a popular evangelist during this time. And here's another interesting one, 1954. The phrase, under God, was inserted into the Pledge of Allegiance. You all know the Pledge of Allegiance? One nation. Under God, you know, you, you if you do it enough time, you memorize it. That did, wasn't in the Pledge of Allegiance until 1954. Do you know why they put it in there? You can read it if you like. She's like, it's right there. And it's because uh, the Soviet Union was an atheist state. So it's kind of like, uh, if you're going to be an atheist, we're going to be more religious. Also, the U.S. coins carried the words, in God we trust, after 1956. So these things were uh, part of the 1950s. It was a growing sense of uh, Christian identity. Consumer culture. I have mixed feelings about consumer culture. Not a fan, although I do partake. Here's one. 7,000 television sets in 1947. 7,000. Think about that. There might have been, what, two in Miami? You had to go, you had to know somebody and go stand outside and look through the window of their house or something. 1950, Americans owned 7.3 million. 7,000 to 7 million in just three years. Somebody making money, building TVs. So that, that, required uh, the Federal Communications Commission, FTC. There's some talk about whether they need to develop the 
the government needs to develop some kind of FTC for the internet. That's a big debate right now. You know, freedom of the press. Uh, the other freedom, freedom to. I can't remember it now. I just drew a blank. But the, the freedom of expression, I guess. Uh, there's a lot of talk about censorship and, but what about really uh, raunchy stuff that's on the internet? How do you protect kids from pornography? That's a big debate. And uh, no one really knows what the the best answer is. Freedom of speech, that's what I was trying to think of earlier. And so, uh, you know, just like with the television, resulting in the FTC, uh, the internet may eventually result in more guidance, guardrails, regulations. I don't know how you feel about that. I'm, I use TikTok a little bit. Anybody use TikTok? Don't, don't raise your hands. I, I believe you all do. But I, I've waded in and got my feet wet. Not very good at it. So here are some typical TV shows. The Honeymooners, Father His Best, Jack Jack Benny, and his comedy show. When I used to teach this at, uh, at my college, I would play the clips for them. But I'm not going to do that here. Mickey Mouse Club, Howdy Doody. I grew up on these. Captain Kangaroo. He was in the same city as me, Captain Kangaroo was. Um... Mighty Mouse was my superhero. So I was part of the baby boom. Uh, Americans made up for lost time. All these guys were over fighting in Europe. And all the women, not all, I'm exaggerating, of course. The women were working in factories and making weapons. And not many babies were being born. And the, the war was over and the guys came home. And the women could go back to being housewives for a little while, and babies started being born. And that was the the uh, ubiquitous baby boom generation, which I'm part of. And uh, But I try really hard not to be a typical baby boomer, and I'm really a fan of you guys and your generation. I'm not a basher of younger generations, despite some of my friends who are in my generation. Uh, babies were born between 1948 and 1953, more babies than in the previous 30 years. People were getting married younger. Got to make up for lost time. Everyone wanted to have babies. Okay, we got that point. People got married younger, 22, 20. I got married at 22. We, uh, My wife was 20. We had our oldest child at 20. I was 24. And the nice part of that now is uh, my kids, my grandkids are already your age. And I'm not dead yet. So <laughs> I get to enjoy them. So that was kind of nice about getting an early start. It's harder to do that now. I get it. I mean, there's so many societal factors that are obstacles to try to create a family, try to get a house, try to get a decent job. You got to go to college. I get it. It's it's a much much harder to do that, if not sometimes seemingly impossible. Okay, I think maybe. Stop here. Youth culture arose during this time. There really wasn't such a thing as youth culture in the 19th century. But now you have a affluent middle class. You have teenagers with leisure time. 19-year-olds uh, uh, own their own car. Uh, so now teenagers have buying power. Therefore, they become a thing. And marketers and advertisers, advertisers start marketing to the youth. Culture. Some movies reflected that. Marlon Brando was in The Wild One in 1951. James Dean was in A Rebel Without a Cause in 1955. This was kind of a celebration of youth culture. White country music, Western music, and black inspired rhythm and blues both began to emerge during this time. Have you seen the movie but with Elvis Presley? It's really good. I was, pardon? Yeah, it's called Elvis. It's really good. I've never been a big Elvis fan, but I I enjoyed learning a little bit about him in that movie and appreciated him a little more. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Any questions?